Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burak of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I like to have him on every three or four months to talk about the state of the gold and silver mining industry. He is president, CEO, and director of Sandstorm Gold Royalty, a company with a market cap of $771 million when we're recording this inter- interview on Friday, November 30th, 2018. Nolan Watson, thank you for joining me again. Oh, thanks for having me. So, Nolan, let's talk about the state of the gold and silver mining industry. So when we're recording this interview, the gold price is actually holding up pretty good considering this dollar rally. It's at $12.22 in dollars. The silver price is not holding up as well. It's at $14.15. The copper price has been weak. So, And when I look at also the share prices of a lot of these primary gold and silver miners, they basically turned almost into penny stocks. So what's your view then of the state of the gold and silver mining industry right now? Yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, a good way to describe it is there's obviously a lot of mining people in Vancouver and including in the building that I work in, that people that work for other companies. And a couple of days ago, I was getting into the elevator at seven o'clock in the morning and another mining guy jumped in the elevator, asked me how, like, how I'm doing. And I said, I'm doing great. And he said, how could you possibly be doing great in this market? And uh, my response was, well, it's been so bad for so long, you had to readjust your equilibrium. And, uh, and I think that's the state of the market. It's, it's been very bad for a long period of time. And the challenge with that is that miners have brought their costs down as far as they can. There's no, no further cost reductions coming in our industry. In fact, inflation is starting to, to push costs up and labor costs, especially in, uh, in North America, are starting to push costs of operations up. And and margins are getting squeezed. And uh, in fact, yesterday I was meeting with an analyst from one of the uh, investment banks who said that he doesn't know what mining stocks to recommend to people because right now, uh, with the margins that mining companies have, no one is worth even the low share price that they're trading at. They're just not making enough margins to generate sufficient cash flow to justify any material valuation on that company. So it's it's pretty bad out there. And to add to your points there, Nolan, a lot of mining shares now, they're below that $5 share price. And some of these pension funds and mutual funds, they have in their bylaws that they can't own a stock that's below $5. So it's creating like a vicious cycle. The mining, the, the gold and silver mining companies have been in a bear market now for seven years. They've you know, fight or flight, they've been forced to cut costs. Over the last couple of years, companies that are higher cost have had to sell like, they call it non-core assets. You've seen tons of royalty portfolios sold for cash. They don't have those assets to sell anymore, right, for cash? Yeah, and further to your point, the it's not just share price, it's also market cap dependent. So you've got large cap and mid cap funds that can't own companies under a billion dollar market cap and so if you were above a billion and now you're below a billion they have to sell you so to add insult to injury and then you've got your additional etfs that a lot of the mining companies are starting to fall out of the etfs because their market caps aren't aren't large enough so you've got companies like el dorado that used to be a 15 billion dollar market cap fell to two billion dollar market cap and recently just fell under a billion dollars and now two weeks from now they're going to get kicked out of a bunch of the major indexes and their share price is probably going to fall even further so what do you think is the result then? Is it gonna, are there going to be a lot more f- forced mergers and acquisitions like how Barrick Gold merged with Rangold Resources and how Pan American Silver just bought Tahoe? Do you think that that's going to be, they're going to have no choice to do that? I think then? the Pan American Tahoe is, is the perfect example of a management team that just kind of threw their hands up in the air and went, what the hell, this is, this is crazy, I'm out. And, and I think you're going to see probably more and more of that. So let's talk about, before we talk about Sandstorm Gold, let's talk about the royalty and streaming space in general. So I I think the business model of royalty and streaming companies, especially as they mature, they have more diversified assets, they're more, they they have more cash flow coming in from different sources. They can be flexible in different market conditions and bull markets, bear markets, markets going sideways. So do you think that the royalty and streaming companies are going to do very well um, in this market environment relative to the primary gold and silver miners? Yeah, I guess it depends on what you mean by by doing well. I think that uh, I think our share prices will continue to outperform those of the mining companies, but 
you know, if the gold price goes from 1200 to 1000 but well, royalty company share prices are going to go down. They'll just go down a lot less than mining companies will. And if the, the gold price goes up, I think the royalty companies will perform well. One of the things that, that's happened over the last year, year and a half, which I don't think is a bad thing, is that the multiples that royalty companies are trading at have come down quite a bit compared to historical multiples, although there's still a premium to premium multiples compared to what a traditional mining company will trade at. So you used to have your Franco Nevadas trading at two and a half to three times NAV. Today they're trading at about 1.6 times, 1.7 times. Uh, so a lot more, a lot more reasonable value to uh, to step into the royalty companies. And so you mentioned earlier in the interview, you don't think there's any more cost to cut for the primary gold and silver miners. So you don't think then that these mining companies are going to voluntarily want to cut the selling general and administrative expenses. You don't see the CEOs and upper management of these mining companies wanting to voluntarily take pay cuts to keep their jobs or maybe like asking their uh, friends who are vice presidents to take pay cuts so they don't get fired. <laughs> Maybe you've met different executives in the mining industry than I have, but I don't, I don't really see that. Now, there are certainly going to be forced reductions in management compensation for companies that have done particularly bad. There is no question about that, and, and it will be forced by the boards, and it should be. But uh, unless it's forced on people, I don't think it's going to happen. I think it'll be forced. I was kind of jokingly asking that question. I mean, there's study. I don't know if you've seen all the studies out there, Nolan, but we have hedge fund manager John Paulson. His hedge fund, which invests in gold stocks, says that gold mi- uh, gold, primary gold miners have lost around $80 billion in bad deals in the last decade. I saw another study that the guy said $150 billion in bad deals in the last decade. Yeah, you have to be careful. I mean, a lot of those metrics are... Quite candidly, and, and even including some of the ones that Marcelo Kim and Paulson have put out are, are total crap. Uh, you have to analyze whether something was a good decision or not based on whether or not it made sense for shareholders of the underlying mining company. So I'll give you an example of the math. Back at the peak of the market, a lot of gold mining companies were trading at two, two and a half times net asset value. And if that company uh, that's trading two and a half times net asset value used its overvalued shares, to acquire something that's trading at one and a half times that asset value, you know, a businessman, if those were private companies, the businessman making that acquisition would be considered a, an intelligent, smart, savvy guy because he sold something worth two and a half or sold something worth one for two and a half and he bought something for one and a half with that. So, he, you know, he wins on the relative value. But you're being a public company, along come the auditors and say, well, nothing can be worth more than what it's worth. So you paid one and a half but the accounting value can only be one. Therefore, you've got to go take a write down of that half. So if you're talking about deals that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars, you end up with a write down that's a hundred or $200 million. And all the, the investors who are unsophisticated about you know, the business strategy behind it might think that that CEO is stupid because he just had to take a write down right after he bought something. So you gotta be careful you know, write down numbers don't necessarily mean that it was a bad deal. You can have a write down and still be a good, a good business deal. Uh, having said that, there's also no question that a lot of mining CEOs made a lot of bad decisions at the peak of the market in terms of acquisitions, and a lot of them lost their jobs for it. And some of them still are making a lot of money. Uh, millions of dollars was paid out. So <laughs> yeah, some you'd be surprised though. I think I think about seventy percent of the CEOs in the industry have turned over since. Since 2012. I actually didn't know that. That's very interesting. So so let's talk about copper miners then. So we're at a copper price. We were below $2.80 a pound. I interviewed Rick Rule, who's very knowledgeable about the commodities markets, especially copper. He's a big copper bull long term a couple months ago. And he said that the lowest cost copper producers, the largest and lowest cost copper producers, primary copper producers, produce around $2.50 a pound. So the co- that would tell me then that if the copper price doesn't rally, these primary copper miners that have gold and silver byproduct would be in trouble in the near future. Do you agree with that? And do you think then it's dangerous to look at some of these byproduct streams um, for gold and silver on these copper mines? I would say... Yes, I agree with that number as an average. You've got obviously in an average, there's some that are above that cost and some that are below that cost. So I think it's risky to look at streaming a precious metal off of a copper mine that's above that average for sure. I think copper could fall below 250 if we get 
some recessions, but it doesn't mean that the copper mines are necessarily going to shut off if the operator has a strong enough balance sheet to continue to operate at a loss. It's, it's just so expensive environmentally to shut down a mine, and it's so expensive to start back up a mine from a working capital perspective and from a permitting perspective that if you have the ability financially to operate a loss, it makes sense to do so. So in terms of streaming, I think that if you're going to do it, you got to do it for a lower cost producer. But it begs a good point. I don't see a lot of copper mines turning off in the next little while. But what I do see based on the current copper price and potentially recession coming is that big new copper mines are unlikely to be built over the next several years. And there, there's still a lot of new copper mines that are coming online that were invested in a couple of years ago. You have Franco Nevada, their gold stream on the Cobre Panama mine is coming online. You have the underground ramp up from Oyo Tolgoy, which Sandstorm Gold will have exposure to in the future years from now. So there is a lot of, uh, and in, I think I just saw an article this week that the government of Chile wants to increase copper their copper mining production by 4% next year. So despite this drop in copper prices, you have some supply overhang in the market too, which is not going to help the rally for copper prices, at least in the- Yeah, although there's a corollary or an opposite to a lot of those points in the sense that, yes, the underground mine will be turning on, but the open pit mine at Oitoga will be turning off. Uh, the In Chile, they can say whatever they want to. They can say they want to increase copper production by 20%, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, Chile's entering a period of significant labor strife with their copper mines. They've been in it really for a few years now. And uh, it, it almost seems like Chile is... I know analysts don't budget for strikes, but when they're trying to determine what the copper supply is, but they almost certainly should because it happens every year and it's a material percentage of the world's copper supply. So let's transition now to your company. You recently announced an enormous share buyback, the largest one in company history. You've done share buybacks before. Why did you decide to announce such a massive share buyback program? Yeah, well, I, fortunately, we have in the position where we have a strong balance sheet. We can afford to do it without having to take on debt. So that's the first point. We also can afford to do it because we've already gone out and bought more growth than any other streaming and royalty company. So our focus on needing to grow over the next three years is greatly diminished. And we find ourselves in a position where due to the market, the shares of Sandstorm are trading at significantly below what we believe their inherent value to be. In fact, so far below that we think that if we do the share buyback program and drive the share price goes up throughout the next year that we won't come anywhere close to what we believe the inherent value per share to be. And so we had all this free cash flow and a low share price. And we think it just makes sense for shareholders to put our money where our mouth is and buy back shares. Yeah, the stock was trading at a 52-week low before the share buyback was announced, and the gold price hadn't fallen that much. So I was kind of surprised at the action in the share price, but it seems that the stock market overall tends to, now not everyone likes the share buyback, but it seems that the majority of market participants like like the share buyback. Yeah, the feedback we've received has been overwhelmingly positive from our institutional investors and our retail investors. The majority of them are very positive on it and some of them were hoping to see a dividend but for those people what i'd say is we're going to buy back shares and eventually we will pay a dividend and the dividend will be able to be higher because we'll have fewer shares outstanding now you mentioned something also about the inherent value of sandstorm gold shares so you're drilling a lot there's a lot of value there in drilling and adding ounces that are replaced but also i think nolan that a lot of a lot of near-term revenue increases and, and other important things that in the past may have been priced into into either Sandstorm Gold stock or other stocks in the industry are not being priced in. I think there's an argument to be made that the Cerro Moro Silverstream, which comes online in January, that mine's already built, already up and running economically. I don't think that cash flow from that stream, which comes to Sandstorm Gold, you know, in about six weeks, I don't think that's priced into the I would, stock. I would agree with you. I think, well, there's a lot of things that aren't priced into the stock, but certainly this is a market that only pays for current cash flow. It's very short term oriented. And there's very few new people looking and starting their research from scratch at investing in gold companies. So uh, people who are familiar, generally speaking, with the story, but don't pay that close of attention to it, they know that we've got some assets, quote, being developed, but they don't really pay close enough attention to which ones and how far advanced they are. 
And to your point, Sierra Moro, which is the biggest stream that we have coming online, is already built and contractually they have to start delivering us the silver on January 1st. There's no longer any execution risk. And uh, the second asset that we have being built right now is the Arizona project by Equinox. And it is, I met with their CEO two days ago, and it's 90% complete construction and well on their way to pouring gold. So you guys are mostly, in my opinion, just trading on an operating cash flow multiple. I mean, maybe a little above 10 times op- annual operating cash flows. So that's pretty cheap considering all the other exploration upside, all the other revenue growth in, uh, over the next five years that Sandstorm Gold already has paid for. Yeah, exactly. And, and with operating cash flows over the next few years set to double, that certainly is not priced into our stock, which is why we're buying back our shares. Is the other reason you're buying back your shares is it's a really dangerous time maybe to do deals because counterparties, like we discussed earlier in the interview, it's just too risky now to do some of these deals because the counterparties maybe need to improve their balance sheet or go out and raise some equity too. And they just can't uh, take uh, either take on more debt because they've already tried to clean up their balance sheet or they can't sell equity in an environment where they're Well, there certainly are some deals where you look at a project and you go, we would be willing to finance that with a stream, but there needs to be an equity component. And in this market, the equity component is not available. So because of the market, you're right, there are uh, some deals that just aren't happening and we can't do the stream. We are still finding though, good potential acquisitions on assets that are either currently in production or will be within 12 to say 18 months. And if we find one of those and are able to negotiate a good price on it, we'll consider doing those and drawing on our revolving debt facility to do that. But we we've decided at both a management and a board level, any of those acquisitions, we are not going to let them interfere with our share buyback. We are going to complete the full share buyback. And I would say that that's, one of the things, one of the feedbacks that we received since we've announced share buyback is I think there's a significant misconception by a number of investors out there who still believe that our plan is that that is a buyback of up to 18 million shares and we probably don't plan on actually buying all of them back. So just to set the record straight, uh, we are going to buy every single one of those shares back. Very good. So if, you, if you're if you buying back the shares with free cash flow, you could then strategically, this is theoretical, you could strategically do another deal similar in size to the Hyundai royalty, right? Because that worked out. You did what a $50 million deal with the revolving credit facility. You didn't use all of your revolving credit facility. And then you paid back the debt with your cash flow. And now you have a nice asset with a lot of cash flow. I think it's 1 million more per year initially than projected, right? And then you had enormous exploration yeah, upside exactly. on top of it. Since I mentioned Hyundai, just just I, I, another thing that's, I don't think priced into the stock, talk about the carry pump discovery that your geologist found, because I think that's pretty incredible. And obviously I don't think that's priced into the stock, but that's a million ounce of indicated gold resource that's been discovered and Sandstorm Gold. Yeah, so just to clarify, that. obviously we, we didn't, our geologists didn't find the deposit, but they did find the potential for for the deposit. So it's a royalty that we purchased, as you said, about a year ago. And we're massively excited about the exploration potential. Most people didn't really understand the deposit very well. So Hyundai is, it's a huge land package. It's hundreds of square kilometers. It's in West Africa specifically Burkina Faso. It's operated by Endeavor, which is a, a large mid-tier company. And previously it was owned by Acacia. And uh, Acacia had a contract whereby if the resources got above 2.9 million ounces, they could back into the deposit. And Endeavor wanted to make sure that that never happened. So the minute that they got to 2.9 million ounces, they stopped drilling and they turned the drills off for years. And once the asset got into production, that clause fell away. And so they just turned the drills on and continued to find the rest of the deposit. And Kari Pump is part of it. And there's a million ounces there. And, and we think most of those ounces fall on Sandstorm's royalty ground. But there are substantial other exploration targets on the property. And we think that they're going to keep finding gold there for many years to come. And that, that's the type of thing that Sandstorm is trying to find, we believe that's the reason we exist, is to buy royalties and large land packages that have expiration upside that the market doesn't understand. And that once it's fully understood and fully discovered, the Sandstorm shareholders are the ones that benefit from it. 
Very good. And that type of exploration successes is how Franco Nevada was built because they bought like a tiny little cheap royalty and then it's been producing for over 40 years, yeah. throwing off cash flow. And they have a bunch of those. So I want to bring up something because about Hot Modern. So I, I get messages on Seeking Alpha, comments on Seeking Alpha, comments on whenever I interview you underneath my videos on YouTube saying that I, I think they just look at the mainstream media news stories on Turkey and the headlines and say either the hot modern mine will never be built. The Turkish government will confiscate the mine. So what what are most people missing about Turkey and the counterparty you guys have? And isn't Turkey, I've heard you mention this in conference calls, isn't Turkey pro-mining? The, the average person, retail investor, doesn't seem to understand this. I would so encourage those that. investors to rack their brain for one mine that's ever been expropriated, or even more, one business that's been expropriated in Turkey. And they are incredibly pro-business. And despite everything that you read about the fights between Trump and Erdogan, uh, Erdogan and, and Turkey are doing the right things to try to grow a business economy in Turkey. And expropriation is, is totally off the table as far as mining assets are concerned. There's not one Canadian mining company that has ever operated in Turkey that I'm aware of that has ever had anything expropriated ever. So people who say that are ill-informed and those comments just show their lack of knowledge about the subject. So the fact of the matter is that it's an asset that was prospected and owned by tech resources here in Canada. In fact, they're right across the street from us, our offices. And it was an asset that was then eventually filtered down until it got a Turkish joint venture partner called Lady Made in Chalik. And Lady Made in Chalik is um, in very good graces with the government. And they fast track their projects. The last mine that Lydia made in Chilik tried to permit. They did it start to finish in one year. And that's about as good as you can do in any jurisdiction in the world ever. And we're very pleased to have them as a partner and, and we're happy to be in Turkey. And, and, you know, I've been crucified in the past for saying this, but I do believe that uh, irrespective of all politics aside and all religious beliefs aside, that a mining investment in Turkey is if it's unpermitted is safer than a mining investment in canada under the current government in canada so we're happy to be there and we think hot modern is going to significantly reward our shareholders and lydia meninchilic is a multi-billion dollar corporation right they don't just do mining they have power companies so they they know how to navigate the political landscape in turkey the other thing is the tax incentive right so there's a very pro mining tax incentive in Turkey to where the mining company actually gets a rebate, right? An incentive to build the mine. They're taxed at a very low tax rate to build the mine and it accelerates the payback yeah, exactly. rate on the there's, mine. In the there's first a specific years, right? provision in their tax legislation that deals with projects like Hot Modern that says, if you build it, we will reduce your tax rate. I mean, they're doing the exact opposite of what all the African countries are doing, which is saying, hey, your mine is trapped in our country, so we're going to tax it even more than a regular business. Uh, they're incentivizing you to build mines because they want they want the jobs, they want the tax revenue. So the people who are bringing up that this mine will never be built, I mean, the mine, the, from a geological standpoint and the economic estimates I've seen out of the mine, it looks like it's going to be one of the 10 lowest cost yeah, in terms of mines in the world. Gold gold mines in the world you know, I don't, I'm not aware of every single one of them, but of the ones I'm aware of, it is the best lowest cost producer in the world in terms of undeveloped mines. So let's talk about exploration successes so what exploration successes besides maybe carry pump do well, you think i think, the I think market on a number of our assets so sarah moro for example which is another significant one that we've been talking about i think people don't realize that there are two thousand square kilometers of area of interest that are covered by our silver stream and the silver stream goes for the life of the mine it's an epithermal vein system which is the type of system that's notorious for just continually fi finding repeating structures and additional veins and uh, Yamana has started drilling there and they're finding very significant success. And I think that's going to continue to happen quite candidly for decades to come. That is absolutely not priced into our stock. I think at Arizona, which is another one of the assets that's under development right now, there is exploration at depth. If you listen to Ross Beatty, he's talking about potentially an underground mine that could last decades to come as well as additional open pit material adjacent to it that's not in the resource right now that would extend the mine life by almost double. And so none of that's priced into our stock. We think at Hot Modern, we think 
Todd Modern, at the highest grade portion of the ore body, is a hard fault offset, which means almost certainly somewhere else in the property is the rest of the ore body. So finding that, if we find another hot modern, because there's no capex associated with the expiration upside, we find another hot modern, and that would add 50% to Sandstorm's NAV, so on and so forth. I could go through all of our assets, but there's a reason why half a million meters of expiration drilling are being done every year on Sandstorm, on properties that Sandstorm has streams of royalties on. So you launched the Launch Lab earlier this year. Have you started fun, uh, seeding any of these ge- uh, geologists, no, uh, junior mining market companies yet? Here, and one of the things that Launch Lab is is focused on is bringing in other people alongside of us with our investments. And we've been sort of waiting for the market to turn before we do that. Because the last thing we want to do is launch with our first one or two deals and uh, have everybody be down. So we're, we're trying to time good assets with a good timing in the market to get in. If the gold price keeps going down, the silver oh, price is in more no, shape. I would say no than the gold price. Do you agree with that? Companies right now that are making any money worth noting. Pan American Silver and Fresneo are doing okay, but you know, First Majestic Silver is even having problems, and they used to be one of the lowest cost producers. I mean, they did that deal with Primero, right, for the San Dimas mine, and they're uh, having some yeah, problems that's getting their true. cost. True, I would say that the Pan American Silver is doing okay because of their gold mines, <laughs> not their silver mines. <laughs> Let's talk about, so I, I don't hear a lot of, I, I've heard you bring this up in other interviews. I haven't heard a lot of people actually ask you about this. So I, I think Sandstorm Gold, the philosophy from you, the upper management, the board of directors has changed on insider ownership. So it's more aligned with shareholders. So can you talk about how like the philosophy at the company has changed and how um, people like you and, and other directors of the company and management now are focusing yeah, so on buying like, more shares uh, and holding and them along with the shareholders. People who were around when the company was founded. Obviously, we we bought a significant amount uh, at the beginning and along the way. So we're very significant shareholders and it's a significant part of our net worth, which is, is one of the benefits of investing in a, a founder-led company. But as we hired additional employees along the way and other parts of our senior management team and added to our board, those people didn't have the opportunity to get in early when you know we're doing equity issuances at two dollars instead of you know five or six, and so we put in a policy about a year and a half ago that goes through each member in the senior management team as well as the board and applies a a compensation multiple that they have to own of our shares. So, for example, if they're in senior management. Uh, but not, you know, one of the top three senior management, they would have to own three times their annual compensation in the form of Sandstorm shares or restricted share units. And uh, they have, I think, three years to comply with that. And so we put that policy in place about a year and a half ago. And I believe as at today, every single person is now in compliance with it. So our management team and our board are very long Sandstorm stock. I don't think they realized that last year in 2017, I think you told me you put around 50% of your after-tax base income into buying shares on the open market. You did the same thing this year, and now you and your wife own around 12 or $13 million yeah, fact, worth of stock. I've, so, I've I mean, it's a good amount of stock. That you- so I took 100% of my after-tax base salary and reinvested it in the open market into Sandstorm last year. So if, if that's not putting money where your mouth is, I don't know what is, Nolan. <laughs> well, it's easy to do when the share price is where it is. I don't think the company has ever had a stronger foundation of good counterparties. Your counterparties are upgraded. You have good diversified cash flow well, that, now. So that's strong base one of the growth. benefits of where we are today is I got to tell you, as a CEO, I sleep so much better at night today than I did five years ago because the portfolio is so much more well-rounded. We've got so many different counterparties. Our production is coming from so many different mines. We have so much uh, growth. The, the cost of production at the mines is so much lower than it used to be. It's it really is. Um, I don't want to say my job is easy, but it's a lot easier than it was five years ago. Let's transition to another topic. I know you've won a gold medal in accounting. You like to brag about that, that you're an accounting nerd. There's tons of accounting scandals in the US and Canada. I did a video and you saw that talking about the all in sustaining costs, how the miners, the all in sustaining costs that a lot of these primary gold and silver miners claim is just not there because otherwise they would have free cash flow. So what's your opinion then on like accounting fraud and problems with accounting in general with a lot of either yeah, I think private there's a big businesses or publicly traded types of accounting fraud that goes on in private businesses versus public companies. But 
uh, certainly, you know, most of my career has been involved in, in public companies, and I've seen a lot of things over the years. Uh, started out my business career as an auditor for a few years and saw some interesting things and, and uh, worked at firms that saw some interesting things. In fact, my very first job was at a firm called Arthur Anderson, who, for those old enough to remember, was the auditor of things like Enron and WorldCom and Waste Management, etc., and there's there's no end to the creativity that management teams will go through if they're incentivized to do so and don't have sufficient moral quality. Uh, there's no no end to what they're willing to do from an accounting perspective if they can get away from it. I do think Sarbanes-Oxley has helped and reduced the amount of accounting fraud out there, but it certainly has not at all eliminated it. And and it's it's relevant and it's something that all investors should be wary of the problem right now is that accounting financial statements are so complex and there's so much judgment that goes behind them still that a regular unsophisticated retail investor who does not have a uh, an accounting degree there's no chance that they could actually truly understand what those numbers mean because they don't understand the assumptions that are going behind them and i'll tell you i've i've been in rooms where You've got a transaction that seems fairly simple, but the accounting regulations are so complex that you could have three of the smartest accounts in the world sitting in a round in a room, and together they can't figure out how to account for it. And so there's there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of room for manipulation. I don't think we're ever going to get rid of it because accounting is is so complicated that it's just ripe for manipulation, and it's something that we have to just be cognizant of because it's there. Yeah. And the other thing is that like the definitions are changing and the companies now can get away with this. So there's tons, I think over 90% of the S&P 500 publicly traded companies is using at least some form or another of non-GAAP measures. So they don't might not report all their financials in non-GAAP, but at least portions of it are in non-GAAP. And so the definitions can constantly change. It's like moving goalposts. And now you have a lot of deals getting done, Nolan, on EBITDA. And so EBITDA, I said this in another interview, is not really earnings, it's EBITDA. <laughs> but, you know, the banks are, for a lot of these large companies that are bigger than Sandstorm Gold, you know, lo- normal, regular companies not in the gold industry, they're allowing these uh, enormous credit deals to be done, leverage mergers and acquisitions. Yeah, and it's the non-GAAP on measures, EBITDA, that is actually is one thing, too. and it's a positive thing, that the SEC is really starting to crack down on that over the last uh, six to nine months. So they're actually sending letters to all the big uh, big four accounting firms and uh, letting them know that they're going to be cracking down on any disclosure and non-GAAP measures. So uh, people have uh, just a handful of quarters here left to start complying with the new SEC guidelines related to that. So I think that's a step in the right direction. Sandstorm Gold has solid cash flow. And you said that, you know, you don't have to worry about the stuff that's going on with Wheaton Precious Metals, right? Because Wheaton Precious Metals was setting up what Caribbean subsidiaries and trying not to pay taxes. And Sandstorm Gold saw that and yeah, it was a number of years ago, the company Sandstorm years ago, made right? this strategic pivot to say, you know what, we're going to, on every single stream of royalty, we're going to pay tax in a jurisdiction, whether it be the jurisdiction that the mining's happening in, or Canada, which is their head office, or a combination of the two, depending on the tax laws. And so we have gone through a very rigorous Canada Revenue Agency audit now of our, all of our tax years, all the way up to and including, I believe, 2015. And happy to report that there are no changes that they have uncovered that would uh, result in us having to make any changes to our financial statements. So we're pretty pleased about that. I think we're the only royalty company that can say that. Very good. Congratulations. So as we wrap up this interview, Nolan, we're almost done with 2018. There's only about another six weeks left in the year. So what ideally in a perfect world would you like to see for Sandstorm Gold accomplish in 2019? Yeah, in the next 12 months, uh, whether I would the like gold to price see goes up, do down, a few sideways. One is complete the 10% share buyback on Sandstorm. That is, first and foremost, the number one thing on my to do list. And I would like to see us be patient with acquisitions, but I would also like to see us find a couple of either cash flowing or soon to be cash flowing royalties or streams that we can draw on a revolver for. And uh, finally, one of the things I would like to see us do is increase the size of our revolver so we can make sure that we've always got uh, a lot of liquidity. If we can do those few things over the next 12 months, and once 
all the other things that are automatically going to happen, like Arizona going into production, Saramora going into production. So if we can have that increase in cash flow and have less shares and make a couple of smart acquisitions, I think shareholders will be very happy as long as the gold pricing is in there. So I think the long-term shareholders are going to be rewarded starting in January. I think that's when all the growth that has taken years and years of building and unfortunately Agreed. some share dilution over the years is finally going to be paid off. Like I said, I don't think the I don't think the cash flows from Cerro Moro are priced into the stock yet. So if I had more money coming in, I would be buying more shares. So I've been accused of being oh, too biased that. and too pro Sandstorm Gold, but I do put my money where my mouth is too. I think the long term shareholders who who have been invested in the company for years, what the Cerro Moro deal was done with Yamana Gold in 2015, right? So it's taken quite a bit of time. For all those things yeah, that, to come to fruition, the and finally, in January, we start to see those big about cash making sure that we're just buying back shares and only doing deals that are going to be cash flowing soon. Is we want to reward those shareholders who have been patient with us for the last few years. A few years ago, we bought those streams on on Cerro Moro and assets like that, and Hod Modern, and we want the shareholders who put their faith in us back then to be rewarded, even if the gold price has fallen apart between then and now. We want them to be rewarded for that patience. And so that's why the strategy is, is, is what it is. Excellent. Well, I look forward to seeing those cash flows come online when I have you on again in the next three or four months. And um, we'll see what the market conditions are for the gold price because, uh, you know, all the headlines that are going on with these uh, U.S. versus China trade wars, the dollars having a rally. I mean, there's so many things that can that can go wrong now. Um, eventually, the gold price is going to have to go up, Nolan, because no, I don't think the miners, so the primary gold and silver miners, can survive much more of this. And Sandstorm Gold, unlike the primary exactly. gold and silver miners, I think Sandstorm Gold has a good balance sheet to withstand these market conditions. Well, Nolan, I always enjoy our conversations immensely. I think our listeners, they send me you know, uh, emails, requests telling me to have you back on. So I want to thank you again for your time. Yeah, and if our listeners want to website. research Sandstorm Gold more, how did they do it? It's just sandstormgold.com. And I, I would like to highlight too your your asset handbook. So you know you talked about those exploration successes. The uh, the stuff in the asset handbook isn't necessarily priced into the stock, but if you're looking yeah, for that, growth, the, the future of the company is, is mentioned in the asset. Investors handbook. who are the type like me who want to do their homework before investing, that handbook is has thousands and thousands of man hours into it and it lists every single material royalty we have and all of the details about it. I think the company has a very, very bright future. Like I said earlier in the interview, well, I, I think I appreciate the that. foundation of the company has actually never been stronger. And it's about to hit critical mass. You know, in January, that's how many other gold companies, Nolan, and you could probably speak about this more than I, I don't think there's really any other gold companies out there that in the next like couple months are going to be increasing their revenues despite a flat or falling gold price about 20% yeah, revenue increase and buying, buying back their stock with free cash flow. Yeah. A lot of the other royalty and streaming companies, like Not I don't even think they're doing any share buybacks with their cheaper stock right now. I don't think they announced anything yet. Okay, great. Well, thanks for your time. Well, thank you. Please like this video, share it with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, Remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and we'll tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to the wallstreetformainstreet.com website where there's different options for you to do so. Or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.